Professor David Menon from the Centre TBI Project. Thank you. So thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers for asking uh, me to come and share uh, our experience with this project. As you see, uh, it has my name as uh, a contributor in very small letters. And what I'm doing is uh, representing a large number of collaborators in the center TBI behind the wider Interper project, which you just heard about. So uh, what's, what's it all about? Why should we be looking at TBI? Because we've currently got a pandemic of traumatic brain injury across the world. In Europe, uh, it hits 2.5 million people each year, and a million are admitted to hospital. Nearly 100,000 die. In the US, it's uh, 1.7 million. Uh, there's a TBI every 20 seconds and a TBI death every 10 minutes. But the big problem and the increasing problem is in, in the developing countries with increasing industrializations. For example, in India, these are probably underestimates. There are over 50 million traumatic brain injuries, 15 million hospitalizations, and the rate is increasing at four times the population growth with between half a million and a million deaths a year. This is a big problem. But the debts are the least of the problem. It's a, it has a global and enduring impact. There's an enormous burden of late morbidity in survivors, which changes their lives and those of their families forever. And even mild traumatic brain injury can have really quite disabling effects, which may last for months to years. But what we're realizing over the last decade or so is that this, this disability can be progressive in a proportion of patients, perhaps a third to a fifth of patients. And it's an important epigenetic risk factor for late dementia. And that risk may be 1.5 fold or as high as 10 fold, depending on the severity of the brain injury and also your underlying genotype. So all this comes together to say that though people are making a big noise about dementia, it's really important to make the point that neurotrauma is and will remain on projections up till 2030 the most important cause of neurodisability worldwide. We really need to do something about this. So what can we do? Well, we can start off by trying to see whether we know the disease well. Unfortunately, we haven't been doing a great job at classifying the disease and understanding it. Most of our classifications and our uh, pathways for treatment are based on the Glasgow Coma Scale, which had its 40th anniversary uh, in 2014, devised by Graham Teasdale in Glasgow. It's, it's a fantastic clinical tool. But the way it's been applied to traumatic brain injury gives you some gradation of the severity of injury. So for example, mild traumatic brain injury, when you present with concussion to the emergency department, can still have a disability of 10 to 30% at three to six months. Moderate traumatic brain injury, where you are still able to to respond and obey commands results in a disability of probably 50% at six months. And severe traumatic brain injury has probably only one in, in four people recovering to pretty much their original state. Three in four will either die or be significantly disabled. So you would, you would have thought that if we've got all this sorted out and this is such an important disease, we would know precisely what to do for each patient. Unfortunately, we don't. So these are all scans of patients who've been classified as having severe traumatic brain injury. And they have widely differing prognosis, pathophysiology, and perhaps most importantly, treatment needs. So if you look up here, these two patients have what are called surgical traumatic brain injuries. And this patient could return to a completely normal outcome with quick surgery. This patient requires surgery, but may not have a really good outcome. And this patient probably doesn't need surgery at all. So we have patients who require surgery, some people who can improve with aggressive management, medical management, because a lot of TBI is a medical disease. And we need to be able to have treatments to offer in a more precise way. It's not that we don't have treatment. This uh, thing on the right side is our protocol algorithm for traumatic brain injury in Cambridge, which includes something like 40 to 60 interventions, depending on how you slice and dice it. But these interventions are aimed primarily at raised pressure in the brain rather than the underlying mechanisms. They're based on population targets, and they're stratified by side effects. We use the most dangerous therapies late even though they may be the most right ones to use in a small proportion of patients early. So this is not precision medicine as enunciated by the National Research Council and Institute of Medicine in the US. 
In fact, it's not precision medicine at all. What it's more like is this. It's from our one-size-fits-none line because we're not using the right treatments and the right patients at the right time. So the answer to this, one part of the jigsaw that's the answer to this is the Center TBI project, the Collaborative European Neurotrauma Effectiveness Research in TBI project, which is a precision medicine and comparative effectiveness research project in traumatic brain injury, coordinated by Andrew Maas from uh, Antwerp and myself. And it consists of 43 institutions with over 80 scientists who will look at data that is collected from 70 investigating centers across Europe in 23 countries. And as Catherine Behrens pointed out, supported not just by the EU, but also by One Mind, who have helped us with INCF to create portals for sharing of data and analysis of data. What is the study about? Well, we have uh, uh, not just characterization of the patients, but the centers who are taking care of the patients. So we have center pro profiling, providing a context of care so we understand what treatments are offered. Then we have a core study with just under 2,000 patients in each stratum, patients who pitch up to the emergency department and are discharged, so the mildest form of traumatic brain injury, to understand why some of these people have late disability that goes on for weeks, months, and occasionally years. An admission stratum, people who come into the hospital but are not that sick that they go to the ICU, and the ICU stratum. This is underpinned by an anonymized administrative registry data set which allows us to look for generalizability of our core study and look at the impact of process variables which we get in the first of, of, this, uh, uh, of the categories you have there. And then we focus down to smaller populations. We have detailed serial MR in just under 2,000 patients, high-resolution ICU data in several hundred patients, including intracranial pressure recording, intracranial chemistry with microdialysis, brain tissue PO2 monitoring, and high-resolution electroencephalography. Uh, A small <coughs> sub-study looks at electrocorticography looking at spreading depression, and there is an EEG uh, sub-study also going on. The inclusion criteria are very straightforward. You have to have a suspicion of TBI and an indication for a computer, uh, computerized tomography scan, which makes you get to a certain threshold of severity, and you have to present within 24 hours of your injury. There are some very straightforward exclusion criteria, basically making sure that the underlying disease doesn't prevent us from looking at the impact of the TBI on outcome. And we're looking for consecutive consenting patients with a pragmatic definition, sometimes in windows, but making the point that we want a representative data collection so we don't just get the patients who happen to come at convenient times. All these data will be combined and are being combined in uh, repositories of clinical data, the physiological data, neuroimaging, DNA, circulating biomarkers, and outcome data. And many countries where ethics uh, permissions allow have patient identifiers stored for long-term follow-up, and we have used these data sets to build research networks. So we have a set of prioritized research targets, and it's useful to just look at how the data fall together. We have here the core data set of just over 5,000 patients. Within that, you have the more detailed studies in 1,500 patients, four times that number in the study registry, so allowing us to make sure that this is generalizable to the patients who come into the centers. Combining that with national registries, making sure that our centers, particularly in the UK and Germany, represent the national populations of patients, and then international collaborations across the EU, USA, Canada, Australia, China, and India, which I might have time to talk to you about later on. And then we have a, a whole category of evidence synthesis and communicating that evidence with a lot of translation, uh, knowledge translation, and implementation science built into it. Very importantly, all of these repositories are going to be stored for eventual open access, so they provide a research legacy for future studies. So this is our recruitment. This is what I downloaded yesterday. We are up to about halfway to our target with uh, 2,600 patients in the core study, getting on for 10,000 patients in the registry, and 57 current actively recruiting sites. Some sites have finished their recruitment and dropped out because uh, they've reached their target. But importantly, as Catherine Behrens pointed out, what makes this special is that it's part of a bigger whole. 
and that is the International Initiative for Traumatic Brain Injury Research, which is not a collaboration of just of uh, academics, but a collaboration of funding agencies, uh, the European Union, the National Institute for uh, Health, the CIHR, and One Mind for Research. And these are the studies that initiated the interbear collaboration. But currently, using both direct and leveraged funding, there's getting on for $100 million worth of uh, research funding for this. We will eventually recruit data on 25,000 patients with traumatic brain injury, 10,000 of whom will have quite detailed uh, information. We have information, uh, involvement of Chinese and Indian centers. The Chinese uh, project is led by Professor Jiang from Sh Shanghai. Uh, the uh, Indian project is still uh, being built up. It's being led from the All India Institute for Medical Sciences in, in Delhi. We see this as a generational opportunity for traumatic brain injury research. This is a Framingham study for neurotrauma. So Intber is more than the sum of its parts. It is the logic of common data platforms, the common data elements which um, Catherine referred to, which means that each of us are collecting data which has the same vocabulary, syntax, and grammar, allowing us to combine data sets. The opportunities provided by spontaneous treatment variations, because there are some centers, for example, that always take out bruised bits of brain, and some centers that don't. To run a randomized controlled trial of that would be very difficult, but looking at natural variation will provide really important insights that could change management over the coming years and decades. The public benefit of open access to curate the data, essentially we make the whole neurotrauma research community our research team. The strength of numbers will mean that impossible questions suddenly become answerable and we can have new research paradigms the incremental phenotype, and I'll talk to you about that a bit later, and use data-driven approaches such as those being pioneered by NCF. And this power of networks can accelerate knowledge transfer to patient care, and that implementation science part in Center TBI is really a very important thing for us because, as Gethi pointed out, it's not just enough to know, we have to do. And this could result in a paradigm shift in research collaborations and yield an investment that will yield scientific uh, dividends in the future. So two examples of how this is developed. First of all, the GAIN consortium, genetic associations and neurotrauma consortium. We're now in the second stage of an application to Wellcome Trust. It's a pragmatic consortium of interbear partners from Center TBI, Track TBI, which is our American sister uh, study, uh, recruiting 3,000 core uh, patients. The CIHR cohorts, which are focusing primarily on mild and sports-related TBI. And then, because Intbear is not a project, it's a concept, all of these researchers who include most of the major neurotrauma centers in the world are bringing their old data sets which have been properly curated and ongoing studies outside Intbear are collecting data with CDs so we can bring everything together. We look for both minimum uh, phenotypes so we can do really large-scale studies and then very refined studies using a very detailed phenotype with neuroimaging or treatment variables and neurocognitive testing. There's a common genotyping platform which has been developed at the Broad. Jonathan Rosan and his colleagues, along with Arno Palotti, are the people from there. And we will genotype at three centers in order to avoid all of the regulatory barriers, and then we can bring the data together to undertake meta-analysis later. So at the Broad Institute, the Finnish Institute for Molecular Medicine, and probably the Center for Applied Genomics in Toronto. We are now at 12,000 patients and growing, and it's salutary to, to recognize that this is now 10 times the largest genetic association study that there was in the past. So I talked to you about the more detailed phenotype. Let me give you an example in my last slide. So this is a uh, frontal projection of all of the white matter tracks in a normal person, one of my neurosurgical consultant colleagues. And this is... Um, color-coded to show the direction of white matter fibers. And now I'm going to show you data from one patient acquired at several time points, so two days, one week, six weeks, six months, and one year. And what you can see is between two days and six weeks, there's a loss of white matter. It's not surprising. This guy's had a, a, a severe traumatic brain injury. But then after six weeks, going on to six months and one year, there is an ongoing loss of white matter in the brain. 
this brain does not just have the residual effects of a bad traumatic brain injury. It is an acute process, but it is a chronic process. It's initiated acutely, but goes on for a long time. This is just a picture, but the important point is that this pattern is seen in 10 to 20% of our TBI patients, and the loss of white matter correlates with recovery and cognitive deterioration, what's been called negative, negative neuroplasticity. It now provides both a new treatment target and a new biomarker for that treatment. Now, in centers like ours in Cambridge, which is a very active neurotrauma center, we might actually pick up over a five-year period 20 patients who have the willingness to come back for such follow-up and have clear phenotypic characterization. In Intba, we will have several hundred patients so we can ask the question, what makes these people different? And one of the things that might make it different is one of the neurodegenerative processes, such as amyloid deposition in the brain. And I'll finish with this, not because this is the cause, but many of the tools that we have now developed for chronic brain disease, for neurodegenerative disease, can be applied. And this is showing PET imaging of amyloid in the human brain from our center, but there are many other processes that we would want to interrogate. Thank you very much.